Hello, welcome to Shad Life. Well, I'm gonna talk about forks today. Um, it's funny because Pink Bike just released some more huck to flat, and I was watching the forks compress and kind of thinking to myself, I should do a video and talk about kind of that compression and how it works. Uh, the large majority of higher end forks have air in them and I just want to describe kind of why that works so well. Why does air work really well in forks? Um, I'm going to mainly focus on compression and what the air does. I'll talk a little bit about volume spacers in this video. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about what happens on the other side of the fork. So um, for the longest time I always thought that each side of the fork was identical, right? When, I mean, we're talking probably 90s here, right? Um, and then I realized, oh, one side has a cartridge or a, a you know, damper, whatever you want to call it in it. And then the other side has either a spring or air. Back in the day, there were sometimes elastomers <laughs> or elastomers and springs combined. I mean, it's pretty funny when you think back to the history of forks, but air became the dominant way to do forks. It's lighter. That's probably the biggest reason. And it's infinitely adjustable on the fly. You literally can take a shock pump, pump air into your fork and get it exactly where you want it to be, which is really important. And that's why air forks are dominant. Although if you ride really, really hard and you have a lot of really hard impacts, there are uses for springs still, um, but we're talking more downhill applications, things like that. Um, but for most people, air will do just fine. All right, let's get into the actual details on the fork. So, here is a kind of graphic of a fork and on one side of the stanchions, so the stanchions are the legs that come down into the lower part of the fork. So there's lowers and then the upper includes the stanchions which slide into the bottom part of the fork. Um, there are upside down forks, we're not gonna get into that. They essentially work the same. <laughs> they're just everything's reversed um, so basically one side is going to be your control side and that's where all the you know devices you know dampers things like that are in there to kind of control how fast things go so like if you're going to have rebound and things like that all that stuff is determined basically by valves and oil flow um, basically, um, how fast your fork retracts, uh, you can actually control a little bit of when it kind of compresses, compresses and things like that. So even though I'm going to talk about the air being kind of your compression setting, you can do minor adjustments and that's usually a dial on the top to uh, kind of help with that control of compression and so on and so forth. So that can get really complicated. Um, but the one side of the fork where there's air, I'm just going to talk about the air side and kind of what the air does and why that works the way it does and why it works like a spring, but it isn't a spring. So let's get into that bit. So in the Marzocchi Bomber uh, Z2 fork that I have, um, and same with the DVO forks and stuff. I'm going to talk more in particular about that one because it's a simpler design to talk about. Um, basically, you have all the junk I was talking about on one side, and then the other side you have an air chamber, and you can actually undo the top and see into the air chamber. Well, the cool thing about that is I can undo the top and underneath that cap where the air goes in, there's a little like kind of area I can click um, volume spacers on. So volume spacers are gonna play a role in kind of how 
a fork compresses. So I'm gonna first talk about the compression without volume spacers and then we'll talk about why volume spacers change this behavior some. So here is a fork at full extension um, and unweighted. So we don't have uh, any weight on it. So there's no sag. Unweighted means no sag. Sag happens when you get on the bike and there's that initial bit of compression. You actually want sag. I think people think sag is taken away from your travel, but it's actually not, believe it or not because you want your fork to actually extend from sag to full extension when you go through bumps and dips and stuff like that. You want your wheel to actually track into those dips. You don't want it to skip over. If you had no sag, you basically would just skip right over a uh, bump. So um, sag will be that initial compression. So at uh, once you get on the bike, but at full extension, you can tell I have it be kind of a light gray in that chamber, right? So now let's get on the bike, right? <laughs> Which we're not actually gonna do, but pretend we get on the bike and we, we go about that roughly 25%, 30% sag. Well, what happens there is notice that the air gets a little darker gray. That's meaning that the air is getting more compressed into a smaller space, right? So that actually makes the fork a little bit stiffer. So if you get on a bike and you kind of push down on it and it's kind of springy at the top, but as you get down into the travel, it gets a little bit harder. Well, that's why, because you're actually giving less space for that air to be in. And that's the compression part of this. And as that air becomes more dense, because the space is getting smaller, the, the fork is gonna wanna push back at you harder, right? Um, so um, here we, re we imagine we hit like a, a bump in the trail and we compress the fork, let's just say 50%. Well, now that gray gets even darker, which is even more dense air. So now the fork is getting stiffer, um, right? As we get further into the travel. And then let's just go all the way near bottom out, right? And now we're at like almost black, right? Because that air is getting compressed into such a small space. <laughs> there isn't really anywhere for it to go. <laughs> um, and yes, they build in this into the fork so the fork will bottom out before it runs out of air because otherwise you would just blow up your fork every time you bottomed out right if you bottomed out and didn't have anywhere for the air to go it would bottom so the fork will bottom out before the air runs out of space right they're designed that way right um so now if we start taking the weight off because there's so much compressed air in there, it just wants to push the fork back up. Um, this is why we have all the junk on the other side of the fork, because if we had nothing over there and it was just purely air, the fork would compress and then it would just spring back. It would be like a pogo stick. It would just be like, ping, 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 right? So that's why we have all this valving and damping and other stuff on the other side of the fork is so, because there's so much pressure on it, when the fork is compressed, it's gonna wanna spring back really hard to get the fork back to full extension and we wanna control the amount of that on the other side of the fork. So that's basically in a nutshell how compression works is as the fork compresses, the air gets more compact, thus creating more pressure. So you may put, let's just say you put 200 PSI in your fork. Well, when you're, you know, got that fork way compressed, it's probably at what, 400 PSI? I guess I don't know the math of volume and how much it would be reduced, but it's, you're actually increasing the amount of air pressure by reducing the amount of space. And then um, that, will push back. So this is why you want to follow the manufacturer's recommended um, 
air because if you go above, you could put more air in your fork than what the manufacturer recommends. So if the manufacturer says 250 PSI is your max, right? And you put 400 in there and your fork is super stiff, great, right? Until you hit <laughs> something really big and compress that fork. Now that amount of air pressure is going way above what the manufacturer designed the seals and the fork for, and that's when you can blow out your fork. So even though you can sit there and pump more air into your fork than what the manufacturer says and nothing's going wrong, your seals aren't blowing out or anything, they will blow out once you hit something and once that fork compresses. So you want to stick within what the manufacturer says for max because your fork is gonna actually get a lot more pressure than what you set that max pressure at, <laughs> if that makes sense. All right, let's talk about volume spacers. One of the things I really like about volume spacers, and here's a picture of a fork with just, you know, some area taken out in there, which are these plastic things that I snap into my fork, um, and you can put you know, one, two, three, or whatever, right? Every manufacturer does it a little differently, but in my uh, Z2 fork, I have three volume spacers. And the reason why I put them in there is because I want the fork to have that soft top feel. So when I'm going over bumps, I like it to take that chatter out. So there's two ways to prevent your fork from bottoming out. One is add more air right so if i add more air and make the fork really stiff and i don't have that initial 25 percent 30 percent sag right sure i can prevent my fork from bottoming out but then it's going to ride like crap it's going to be all over the little chattery bumps things like that so volume spacers are like awesome because you can put them in there set your fork sag how it should be have that initial kind of movement at the top of the travel to take out all that small chatter. But what happens is as the fork compresses, now that volume of air is less. So it'll ramp up is a term that we use, like that compression will increase faster because there's less volume to work with because these spacers are in there. So here's the fork compressed at like 50%. Notice that the gray area is a little darker than the last 50% compressed fork, right? And then here it is almost bottomed out and it is the air is just fully black, like fully thick and dense in there. So it's preventing the fork from bottoming out on a hard hit. Um, so that's what volume spacers do. If I didn't have volume spacers in my Bomber Z2 fork, that, and I ran my sag at what I prefer it at, so I have that nice little cushy feel at the top, um, I bottomed out all the time. I was always hitting uh, full bottom out um, really easily, landing off of jumps and stuff, and I didn't like that. So now that I have volume spacers in there, I get the best of both worlds. I get that kind of nice feel at the top, and it doesn't bottom out as easy. I mean, yes, I can still bottom out the fork, but that, we're talking a really hard hit to do that. And that's going to happen. Like if you watch these huck to flat videos, they're bottoming out the forks all the time. And they're designed to be able to bottom out. Like I said earlier, there is like a bump stop or a stopper in there to prevent the fork from going beyond a certain point. Because if it did, you'd blow seals, You'd cause all kinds of problems and things like that. So bottoming out te technically shouldn't harm your fork if the fork is designed right. So just a quick recap. So one side of your fork is your spring, and in this case, air spring, air fork, right? And then the other side is, I'm just gonna call it like your control. It's where your damper is, things like that, that controls the fork and how quickly it does things um, and so that's necessary because we couldn't just go by air because air is just a kind of a, a fast moving thing there's no way to like say oh slow down the rebound with just air right we couldn't do it so the other side of the fork helps 
all of that. So um, I'll get into that stuff in another video, but I really wanted to really get into this compression stuff because um, I don't know if a lot of people know how that works. Um, and I'm talking about forks, right? Front suspension. Um, rear suspension works almost identically. I'm going to say almost because there's you have a lot more uh, things going on. I mean, sure, the shock itself works identical to how a front fork works, right? But there's all these complex linkages or simple linkages, right? Some, like think of uh, my Swamp Master, super simple, single pivot design, and the rear shock is doing everything. One of the issues with that is I gotta run it fairly stiff, <laughs> right? Um, in that particular shock, I haven't found a way to do volume spacers or anything like that. Um, but if you go to my Salsa Ruffler that has split pivot and a super pretty complex linkage system, the way the frame moves and stuff, then um, there can, you can have a lot more uh, adjustment and play in how it feels because your complex linkage is working with the compression and rebound and all that stuff in the um, rear shock. Um, and the rear shock, uh, is likely going to have that all kind of built into it because it's just one sing single cylinder versus a fork where you have two stanchions. So you can have the junk on one side and the air on the other. We call it junk, right? <laughs> Pretty fancy junk, isn't it? All right. So there you have it. Um, I hope you appreciate these kind of tech videos if you do. Uh, let me know in the comments and like and subscribe. Peace.